Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you guys are. Uh, welcome uh, to the GMI Functional Safety Management Webinar. We have collected uh, some questions during registration and we will answer those at the end of the webinar. We also allow you to give us a live uh, question. Uh, there is a question and answer box there, you can use it. We will get to it when we can hopefully to all of them. You know, let's start the presentation. While people join, we can start talking a little bit about GMI. Okay. Uh, some of you already seen our webinar, so it'll be a repeat, but uh, I will only take a few moments. Let me see if I can do this request. Okay. Okay, approve control. Here you go, Paolo, you have control. All right. So, first of all, let me introduce Tino, our speaker today. For those of you who don't know him, let me see if I can go back to the right slide. Okay, here we are. So Tino has over 30 years of experience in uh, the process industry and is a senior functional safety expert and trainer for under the CIS program of TUV Rhineland. He has published many papers, uh, run many, many, many seminars, and therefore is very qualified today to talk about functional safety management. And in fact, he likes to talk a lot. So I will try to keep my presentation as short as possible. GMI. Okay, I'm a little problem this morning to control the presentation. Okay, GMI, who we are and what we do. We are a safety company. We make safety interfaces, intrinsically safe and C rated interfaces for all automation packages. Uh, from DCS to SCADA, PSC, and so on. We have 40 years plus of experience, and we, have, we are very proud to run our production here in our headquarters in Italy, where we do 100% of our design, engineering, manufacturing. We are, however, a global player, so we are present around the world. Because safety is what we do, we take special care in manufacturing our product. We have full testing. Uh, we are ROS and REACH compliant. We have system SC3 certification for seal by TUV. And we, what we, our motto is 100% customer satisfaction. And <clears throat> sorry, by doing better product for a better world because a safer world is better for us and the environment. These are the product we manufacture, IS barriers, safety relays, isolators, power supplies, multiplexers, termination boards, half multiplexers, surge protection devices, loop indicators, and we have a division that runs training and services in functional safety and soon in EX domain. Let me take a second to, we have a lot of requests in your, you know, a lot of people are asking about, uh, about seal relay, safety barrier. We have many other webinars which you can attend, which will talk about this. Today, we only talk about financial safety management. We are a global company, as I said, so we have eight direct subsidiaries. We have many, many distributors. There are about 200 people and we run many, well, we used to run many webinars, seminars, sorry, you know, Tino, as last year we did about 18 courses, this year only a couple because of the COVID situation. Hopefully, Tino, in uh, September, October, we should be able to start again, no? We have the first uh, confirmed two or three trainings in September already, yes. You told me earlier that uh, perhaps we will be able to run training online through TUV. That's something we are uh, considering and discussing currently because the exam needs to be done um, in front of a person that is in control. So one of the ideas is maybe to use some of the TOV offices to have an exam center there. Very good. Let's hope uh, we are able to go back to our courses and you guys will let you know when, they, that, when the, that will happen and, and let's hope soon. So we have thousands of installations around the world and uh, this is some of our customers. We interface and operate and work with all the system vendors from ABP to Yokogawa. We've done many projects with all the EPCs around the world. And we supply too many OEMs uh, like 
slumberger or G, uh, gas turbo machinery. And we are in the AVL, which means approved vendor list of all the, well, not all, but many, many oil and gas company. Okay, well, that was very quick. Uh, you guys, any more questions about GMI, you can log on to our website and you can you know, send me an email. Now, let me introduce, well, let me turn it over to Tino. Let me see if I can release control here. Stop. Give up remote control. Here we go. Now, Tino, you're in control. Okay, good. Well, again, thank you, Paolo, for the introduction mm -hmm. and allowing me to talk here in this webinar today about film safety management. The um, film safety management itself, as you can see here on this slide, you look here at the life cycle of the IEC 61511. This is the process industry dedicated standard to uh, design, build, maintain, and operate a safety instrumented system. Process industry is still oil and gas, fire is still the uh, chemical and petrochemical. What is new by the second edition is also pharmaceutical and food and beverage. So today we only going to talk about, well, only, it's a hot, it's really a, a long top topic, but as Paolo said, I have to minimize my time and I will try, I promise. But the management of function safety is the overall management of quality here on all these activities, which you may recognize. And some of the webinars, we will do the extra ones and the one that were passed already, which you can find on the YouTube channel, they all recorded. Well, those are, some of them are handling the specific activities. What is management of functional safety? It is actually, um, it is a management of a quality. I was just reading a question. Some, some person has a problem with the sound, but I think the sound is good as I don't yeah. see any is more. Anyone have, yeah. Does anyone else has problem with sound? You let us know. I think, you know, probably guys check your setting yeah. on your computer to make sure you can hear us well. All right. So the management of functional safety is a, is, a, is a quality issue and it is, it is really looking to address the systematic failures which are mainly caused or typically caused by humans. Very simple. If you don't do anything, you never make a mistake. If you do things, of course, you can make mistakes. So what is functional safety management is trying to have a method in place, a quality scheme in place, to try to minimize or try to avoid making human failures. The real problem we have is we can never predict when we will make a failure. That also means all these predictions today on your instrumentation, on your safety systems, are all based on that instrument. Will it be available to work or not? What we can never predict, will there be a person involved that has made a human mistake? We cannot predict that. That's the second bullet over here. That means we cannot put a number on there. That's also why it has never been part of any estimation on your availability of your systems. Function safety cannot be implemented without the involvement of humans. So it's really a hard nut to crack here because on one hand you said humans can make mistakes, but we need those humans to achieve function safety in the first place. So somehow we will have to ensure that Whatever we are doing, we will try to do it with a certain quality and you need to have some principles how we will measure, how we will monitor and how we will test that. And that is the topic of functional safety management. It's not just a giving fact that on a project phase, maybe the system integrator or the EPC contractor or whatever will do functional safety management and then the end user doesn't have to take it over. It is actually a evolving mechanism through the complete life cycle wherever you are uh, in the life cycle active. Now, if I go to the standard itself, and we abbreviate here FSM, stands clearly for Functional Safety Management, we have two options. The new edition two allows you or to follow the Functional Safety Standard, which you see over here, if you see the mouse moving. This is the IEC 61508, Second edition, which is part, uh, it's edition two, which is the 2010 release. And there you can follow either that film safety management framework, which is described there in part number one, or you are free to choose any other FSM, which is actually the requirements of the standard, which is derived from the 61508. In our case, would be here the 61511 itself. So my recommendation is, I would not personally recommend for an end user to try to achieve or try to apply 
the 6508 uh, Film Safety Management, because that would be really, 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 let's say, restrictive and probably a challenge even to try to achieve it. I would recommend to go to the 6511 standard and use that one. Now, what is function safety management objective? What do we try to achieve? As I told you already, we try to have a good quality in work and we try to reduce making human failures. Meaning that define, document and monitor and assess requirements for every single technical and non-technical or management activities. So to try to explain it simple, if you do a activity, it has to be defined on a reference document on how to do it. It has to have some principles on how you will check you have done it correctly. So we call this the monitoring. And also here the assess requirements. So assessments is a specific topic, which is a, one of the next webinars coming up, I think next week, that's called functional safety assessments. Those are senior people, or at least there must be senior people in that group, which is competent and independent from design to do states uh, one, two, three independent from operator and maintenance of the SIS for stage four and five. Again, we have a separate webinar on that. Second bullet of the objective of FSM is we need to specify whoever in your activity roles, I mean, in your life cycle activities, who is responsible for what on person, on department, and even on organization level, because that needs to be specified in your film safety management plan. So when you have your assessment or your inspections done, that is the reference document that will say who was responsible or accountable for doing what. And as I said here on the bottom, clearly having an FSM plan without an assessment and audit does make sense. So when you have a quality scheme available, you have to live to it. That is basically what we say over here. Right. I hope that Paolo is still on. He's on. We have I'm a... here. Just try not to, you know, just okay. leave no problem. the steam. So we have a poll, a question for you guys. Let's see if you've been listening. Uh, in which phases IEC 61511, functional safety manager is required? During which phase? Oh, I got some answers. During the analysis phase, during the design phase, during the operation and maintenance phase, or during all phases except the commissioning phase? always on all the phases well i see the answers start coming in and uh, most of them are correct i would say 90 percent correct so if i know the answer correctly <laughs> well, you... me and Tio don't talk about this before you know we're very busy he's very busy i had a few moments before the the webinar started about half an hour before we start talking but we, i didn't go through these uh, questions so Let's hope I have the answer correct. It's a bit of an easy poll question also, to be honest, but I'm glad that uh, the majority is all sharing the same ID. Yeah. yeah. It's a uh, it's opportunity for you guys to only have let us know what you know and how you feel about it, you know? Yeah. Okay. At the end of the webinar, we will also pull about how we did. So, you know, you keep looking for our mistakes. Okay, let's end the poll. I think most of the people have uh, answered and share this result. Okay, 90%, I believe, answer correctly, right, Dino? Correct. It's clear that uh, FSM, in some certain people's opinion, is often related to a project design phase. Other ones are saying no, that is for the end users. It, it is for everyone. It doesn't matter where you are in the life cycle. So it doesn't matter if you are in the risk analysis or in the LOPA or whatever you are. So it is actually for everyone. Including okay. us, including manufacturers. We have to follow functional safety management for our you know, life cycle, the design of the product. And the FSM is coming from the 6508 ID that the manufacturers need to do that during their design, during their services, etc. That means it's the same that is carried over here in the uh, application specific in the 6511 standard. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Do I have to close yeah. the poll? Probably, yes. Okay, I close. I already it. closed the poll for everyone. Good. Okay. Right. Well, we already gave away this answer also. Who shall follow now an FSM and use the FSM? And as I already mentioned, it's for everyone. It's not only for the system integrator, 
for a system manufacturer or for the design company, engineer company, whatever you call them. So it is actually basically throughout the complete life cycle for whatever company is involved in the activities. The second bullet is an interesting one that uh, many people do not like to hear when they come to, let's say, real trainings or to real seminars. Here I got a webinar, so I cannot see the reaction on your face, which is sometimes a good thing. But if a supplier makes any functional safety claim for a product or a service, so it doesn't matter what you do in the life cycle, any service you do in the life cycle, any product you supply, well, that supplier shall have a functional safety management system. And in the early days, when this came out in February 2016, I did have some, let's say, arguments. I, had, I did have some discussions mm -hmm. with end users saying, Tino, this is not for us. This is for suppliers. I said, Mr. End user, during your operator and maintenance phase, when you run your plant for 15, 20, 30 years, you don't think you supply a service in the life cycle to maintain your system or to operate your system? A supplier is not a physical supplier, as you may think of a manufacturer supplying you a product. We are talking here about anyone supplying a service, including you, also the operating company or the end users. The so we have a question which I believe fits right in here. So it says for a system integrator, like making IPS, which of course has to follow financial safety management, but according to 508 or 511? That's a very simple answer. If the system integrator is buying the products from a, let's say, suitable, compatible vendor with a SIL qualification, then for the product delivery, that is the FSM of the 6508. You as a system integrator combining all the products together, you will have to follow the 61511 because you are supplying in phase number four of the life cycle, you are designing a system, in this case, which is called a HIPS. Last bullet on this slide, which is the one that I wanted to highlight here. That's an interesting one that many people now, they come up with a FSM plan, with a function safety management, a plan, a procedure. But the question from the standard is, do you have a procedure in place to prove, to demonstrate with evidence how adequate you are following that? And my summary here, or, or my example, is very simple, the following. I have many, many, many projects where we do some, let's say, assessments, inspections, and all that. And all of these big companies, they all have great ISO 9001 qualities, management systems in place, et cetera. Now, when I then ask the project engineers, the project managers, how many of you for this project we are inspecting have used the quality management system? Can you prove me that? And some of them, they can prove, they have tons and tons of checklists and they will show what they have done to prove they followed it. But equally, lots of people said, you know, we didn't, we didn't even read the quality management system. We have no time for that. So same here. Does it make sense to create a monster of an FSM, but no one can use it, no one can prove they're using it? So it's the same principle. When you have a quality scheme, live to it and prove it. Now, as I have to monitor my time, and I don't want to overrun in time as I usually do, the basics of functional safety management. The black text over here, or the black color in this bullet list, of the standard. You know, you are, uh, are Tino, quickly Tino. what I added on of it. Tino, give us a second. Your uh, internet connection seems slow and you might have a little problem. Are you still with us? No specific. Who of those persons are involved? You're back. Uh, now you're back. Now you're doing okay. For a moment we lost yeah, you. I I just saw here a message popping up saying my internet is unstable. I'm of course not in my home office. I'm in a different office for the moment, but anyway, it doesn't matter. It's You're okay. Let's there. start again on this slide. Good. You re repeat this uh, slide. Thank you, Paolo. I also put my flight mode off of my telephone, Paolo. So if there would be a problem, you could just wave me on my telephone and I know I got a problem, which okay. I hope not. Anyway. Organizational resources. So we were talking about something strange here on this capital sources, but it doesn't matter. Persons, departments, organization, responsibilities, competencies. In a nutshell, anyone involved in that activity for that specific project, we want to see 
what is the person's responsibility, what is he accountable, he or she accountable for, what is he or she competencies, and competencies we will look at formal training, we look at experience, and of course we also will look on how do you measure those experience or those competencies for this particular function that is responsible or accountable. Second bullet, risk evaluation and risk management. That means hazards shall be identified as one of the requirements from the FSM of the standards. So everything that you do in the life cycle needs to be, the hazard needs to be identified, needs to be evaluated. We need to see some evidence for that also. Safety planning and safety, we don't do anything without planning. That means it's all paperwork. Once you plan, once you define it, well then someone can actually go and check it. You can make assessments or verification, etc. Implementation and monitoring, those are all those measurements which I mentioned before is, does it make sense to have a scheme in place without being able to monitor it, without being able to find evidence that people are actually have following the qualities. And the last slide here on the basics is assessment, audits and revision. It's a normative requirement and next week we have this uh, webinar on the FSAs, stands for Fung Safety Assessments. And we will differentiate between stage one, two, three, four, and five. Now, edition two has changed tremendously on how we look on those assessments where edition one didn't have that. Mainly for the end users, for the operating companies, any, anything to do with operating maintenance, there will be periodic review required. And last but not least, we have the SIS configuration management. And the management of the configuration of your SIS, you may say, oh yeah, but that's, that is purely so pulling a record on what type of system we are using. Well, it is not that straightforward or easy as you may think of. Because many operating companies have a large installation. And the question is, how will you actually monitor all the specific different revisions of all your sensing elements with all your different firmware, etc., etc.? Right. So it looks a little bit complicated, this factual safety management issue, huh? Let's it see. Is, uh, you can make it very complicated. You can make it very straightforward. As always, the standard will give you some guidance, but it doesn't give you black and white the recipe what to follow. So I see many different FSMs. And that is, um, well, that is also why we do this poll before I start to explain more. Let, let us first do this poll. So Fung Safety Management is less important for a SIL 1 than for a SIL 3. It's not applicable for a SIL 4. Regardless of a SIL class, it is for any IEC 61511 application. And then we have also none of the above. So I'm just looking here. Participant list is still growing. That means people are still joining in. Yeah. We have done this early webinar because of the time zones. We were hoping to go for a time zone which is long awake already. Yeah, we're trying to reach, you know, uh, some, some areas like uh, west, where people, you know, or east, you know. We do, we're doing uh, now webinars in the morning, midday, and evening, trying to catch, you know, the world around. We are sitting in Europe, so, you know, we are yeah. in, uh, in the middle. Yeah. Okay, let's see how they... Uh, not only above, uh, I, I haven't followed this. Less important, not applicable regardless. Okay, I believe, you know, let's okay. end the poll, you know? Yes, you can end the poll, please, yeah. Share right. the result, here we go. And the majority, as you, can get, as you can already imagine, the majority has it all correct here from those who have voted, because not, the, not, the, of course, not everybody has voted, but you know, majority, 50% yeah. voted. And for those uh, minor group who are saying none of the above, well, unfortunately, it is certainly one of the above. It is regardless any application. It doesn't matter if this is still... It's all of the above, actually, right? Yeah, so it's... Uh, well, it's not all of the above. It is uh, only the one that is selected there correctly, which is regardless of the SIL class. Yeah, yeah, I so, see. But, I mean, it applies everywhere, this financial safety management. I mean. Correct. And the reason why I have done this poll, and you, let, let me... Can you close, Can you close it? Okay. See if you have some questions. Let's see if anyone uh, uh, applicable now. Yeah, you want to tackle those questions because you are also- Well, we have people asking about certification, functional safety management certification. I imagine, you know, you can get into that maybe later, but 
I can. This one doesn't require certification. It just says that you need financial safety management. Um, food safety management is a normative requirement. It doesn't say it has to be audited or inspected or accredited by a third party, but typically that is what vendors will do or even system integrators will start to do. But it is not a must from the standard. Even the word certificate is not a must from the standard. It's an, let's say, an independent evidence that someone investigated and made a statement on a piece of paper that the majority of the people around the world call this a certificate. Let's say but a certificate, the easy way to prove your financial safety management. It's an easy customer. Yes. And it is more and more a common practice. But um, the standard. And there is not a given certificate. Does, you can get it from anyone that supplies a certification from a TUV to, or a company like GMI. Sometimes we are doing financial safety management assessment, right, you know, in companies. And we can say you can go to a larger company like TUV or Exida or DNV and get your certification, or you can take our word for it and take our piece of paper. Correct. And the standard doesn't mandate one company or another. In fact, as, as you rightly said, doesn't mandate a certificate. Although as a manufacturer, if we don't have a TUV certificate, we cannot sell our product because the customer don't want it. They always ask for it. Okay, so coming back to the poll. The poll was again very easy because I, I have been told that my previous polls were a bit too challenging. So I thought let's make it more easier because we go for a, a broader, let's say, uh, yes. participants list around the world that may not have the necessary background there already. So what I'm showing you here is actually pretty new, or let's say it's pretty recent, because as you can see here on the title, TR stands for technical report. For those of you who may not know yet, but there is a new report out on the 6.15.11 standard. It has been issued in February 2020. So just before this madness of this corona came into to the industry, we had this uh, release of that document. And in that document, it gives you guidance what are the most uh, common misconceptions, what are the most common mistakes or misunderstanding that people are making. And actually, I, I picked it out of this report that in the, in the eyes of the IEC technical report, they said the number one misbelief is that FSM is actually less important for the SIL 1 than mm. for the SIL 3. And that actually, a SIL class has nothing to do with the quality of the activities you are doing. So we already mentioned that no matter what seal you have, it's the same equal importance. And maybe the misconcept is growing from the older standard, or let's say from the previous standard from the 61508, edition one and edition two for the manufacturers. It's different for them. The fund safety management is a lot more stricter for a seal three than, for instance, for a seal two or a seal one. And I, I'm talking about not more stricter, I'm talking about more um, independent between the people doing the work and the people checking the work. Like for instance, if you claim as a manufacturer a SIL tree, you shall have an independent organization making a judgment that you reach your SIL tree. And that is where we have all these accreditation offices coming in, and that is what they do for a living. Now, second bullet, project teams desire typically Project teams, they're always under pressure, project planning, project budget, etc. And unfortunately, what we see happening is many people treat food safety management as a formality. They have checklists, they tick the box, done. But then you ask him, did you think about what you just ticked off? Can you prove that? So FSM is a living system. It's not a formality. You have to live to it and you have to maintain it even once the system is on site. So also for the operating companies listening in or the end users, it's also for you that you will have to live to that. There is often the desire to say, well, it's only for after the project startup. Anything before the project startup, we have all the specialists there, don't worry. Well, that's a specific expression for if you go more east, no worries. Well, I would say I would worry if I would be involved in the project because it doesn't matter if I'm now the system integrator or the system manufacturer or if I'm the EPC contractor, it is for all of us. What Paolo was saying, FSM looks complex. And I would say that's a very true statement for many people. But it's always the, the case that if you have never used it before, the first time will be really a challenge to understand what do you try to achieve. And I see many companies, they are doing cut, copy, paste on FSMs because they think this is also normal. Many people said, why don't GMI put an FSM in the book and then we just copy it and then, and then we are safe. 
Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Why do you think the IEC standard doesn't put a recipe in the book? Because there is not one recipe that will fit all the projects around the world. So it's always coming down to the point, do you have competent people that actually are building the FSM for you? And then do you have competent people to carry it out? So again, it's all subjective end of the day. And as long as it is subjective, as long people can start to make some even more mistakes, which is not the essence. The essence was to try to increase the quality to make less mistakes. So the simple life cycle examples depicted in the standard will not give you a recipe to start to follow. It gives you some ingredients, some ideas. What do we have to do? And that is where you have to start the brainstorming over. And that out of there will come the FSM. And I've seen here the question, I think, in the Q&A coming in already, but it was also in the registration. Um, oh, sorry, this is, this, this is probably one of my next slides. Sorry, I'm going faster than my slides. Yeah. So, some, some question, we, we get to it at the right time. You know, yeah. we have answer for them, so I'm, we're not answering immediately. I'm thinking, you know, Tino, FSM in a way kind of looks like an ISO qualification, ISO 9000 qualification, so you're fighting qualification, so you have to, you know, and yes, and this was actually the question that I was referring to. Um, clearly, your quality management system, your 9001, whatever, well, that is already the foundation for a functional safety management system. Many companies will actually join them together, will combine them together. But that is coming up, I think, in one of the Q&A. So let me skip that now. Let's just focus here quickly saying our experience from the industry is that too many companies still today are focusing blindly too much on that SIL number and on optimistical failure data and ignoring the essence of the standard, which is trying to avoid human failures. And only when you start to apply FSM, you will see the attitude will be changing on how you actually look at those SIL numbers or on your optimistical failure rate uh, data. Commonly misunderstood is the grandfather clause. The grandfather clause was actually a concept coming from the ISA 8401-2004 release. Now, as you may know, for people listening in from the USA, we have now the ISA 615-11, which you adopted 2018. Now, in the edition two of the 615 back here in Europe, while well, the IEC came out February 2016, edition two, there is a clause in there called also, well, it's not called the grandfather clause, but it is the same concept as the grandfather clause. And what is here saying in the standard, uh, in the report, it's not a standard, it's actually report four, it's misunderstood that many people think FSM is not applicable for existing systems. And I would say, stop, that's not correct. It is applicable for any SIS. Even when you will apply the grandfather clause, even for that, you will have to think about an FSM. A last bullet, which is also a misunderstanding, which is coming out of this report four, is saying clearly our SIS systems out there, and then I mainly refer to, for instance, your safety PLC platforms. Well, the lifetime on those platforms is also a phase that we will do less frequency, or sorry, we will have less frequent modifications or changes. You will interact less with an SIS than you do maybe daily, hourly, or per minute on your BPCS or your DCS system. That means that if you think about the interactivity on your SIS, will need also to be monitored more carefully because people tend to forget. You may have been trained many years ago on the subject of safety on the SIS. That means the new edition two of the standard is now requiring a refresher or a periodic assessment on competency. And that is one of the items which is coming out of the edition two. Before we go into q and I'm just watching my clock. I think I've done nearly fine. You're doing great. I can support you, of course, with this book. And many of you have this book already. If some of you are interested on the book, you can send in the Q&A uh, the uh, question to require that because you can either or either download it uh, from the website or you can register from the website on GMI and there are two options or you can have a hard copy post to you and then there is just the shipping cost of the post or you can actually do somewhere a download of the book which is like a flip book as an ebook. 
GMI support is not only the webinars which we do now during this COVID time. We had those type of webinars pre-recorded already since 2017, which is here called the GMI Online the Academy. And there you have all the different topics similar to what we discussed now, but that is here pre-recorded. That's the link in here, which you will see to register. And then you can actually go and uh, listen to all the pre-records or that webinar we do now will also be recorded and will be available on a GMI YouTube channel. We can also support you as GMI, of course, with the training, as Paolo mentioned, the TOV Rhineland is one of the programs which we supported under the GMI umbrella. We do mainly the FSS, sorry, the Function Safety SIS Competency Review Program. I lost track, well, I didn't lose track. We have done many for the last three months now because of the COVID. But uh, in total, uh, me personally have done 177 of those specific trainings under the Rhineland program. And I trained personally 2,300 plus people. We have the same program for fundamentals on cybersecurity and for the security risk assessments, which is the two programs in line with the IEC 62443. That's a newer program. We have not done any training yet as of yet because of the COVID, because the first training that GMI was actually looking at was in, in, in the middle of the, the start of the COVID period. So we actually postponed that. We do customized in-house trainings. Many people are asking me, can you do virtual training uh, for the on, online virtually in the COVID time? Yes, we can. And as Paolo was mentioning, we even look at a, a potential solution now also for the accredited TOV Rhineland program. And additional free webinars will follow. We support you also with services. I will not go through all of this, but that's mainly functional safety here on the SIG 1511. And on the bottom, we even have some people that can support you on the 62443. And I give the word back to my co-host here, uh, to Paolo, because yeah. I think he will run some of the Q&As now. Yes, I'm trying to, you know, send. Okay. All right. So, you know, you can stop share. Oh. And we can uh, look at some of this q and I will also see if I can share the Q&A that we already received. Uh, presentation, this is it. Share this one. Okay. You guys should be able to see this. Uh, we have a bunch of live questions. I don't know if you want to get to those before or after we go into the presentation. Up to you, Paolo. Okay. This, uh, our, some of you have asked about the book, you know, there's online gminternational.com, you can find it, it's very easy, you see the book, you just click on there and you ask for your, uh, you know, your copy. Uh, so I dismiss some of these questions because <laughs> they keep coming in and they are the same. Now, uh, let's go to some of these questions and then we'll see. So how to ensure the company financial safety management meets the expectation? This is a question we received during the registration phase. I see the answer you prepared, you know? Yeah, and I actually see it also in the Q&A, Paolo. If I look at the, yeah. the uh, an anonymous, I think it's the same question roughly. Anyway, okay. so yeah. how can we ensure a company meets the FSM? Well, actually a, a very valid question. When there is an FSM in place, the first that I would look for is, can they prove evidence they have followed whatever is on paper written as a quality procedure? That is the first thing. And also the activities, depending on what is here under the umbrella of the company. If you look at the company and you say, well, let's just think about, as an example, a system integrator. Those are the companies who are buying different devices, buying different systems. They do some wiring, they do some uh, uh, coding, they do some application programming inside mainly the safety PLC. So they have a huge role to play in that, in that small topic, which is here called the system integrator activity, because at a certain point of time, they will send this into the field. That means that when they are actually looking at an FSM in place for that specific activity, how do they monitor that their activities, which is for instance, uh, doing the programming of that safety PLC or doing the IO assignments or doing the uh, wiring, etc. How do you see that they have followed the requirements to achieve a quality where they actually have 
minimized avoiding human failures. You can say, oh, well, well, we have a FAT procedure and we will go together to the test and then we will find out they have done a mistake, which is also correct. But also, I would like to see, if I would be the inspector on this particular project, I would like to see the competency of the people working for me on that project, if I would be the client accepting that system. In other words, are the people involved in that project, are they trained to do that? Are they competent to do that? Are they monitored to do that? And how will they prove that? That could be a very simple question if I would talk about a, a system innovator. Besides the you are a tough, you are a tough inspector, we know that. Well, the, the essence of an inspection is to try to highlight the gaps that the people did not recognize yet. Old people do their best to build good systems, I fully agree. Yeah. But many people do not know what they don't know yet until you tell them. And then they start to think about the inspector is doing difficult. No, the inspector is trying to show you items which as per standard requirements is one of the issues that needs to be proven as an evidence that you have followed it. So, and at the end, you know, you're trying to make a safer plant, a safer operation, which is in the best interest of all of us. The end user, the operating company, but uh, you know, the people around it, the people working in the plant. So it's, you know, it's a good job. Correct. And so, as you said, you know, financial safety management, really, you said something earlier I wanted to mention that I forgot about it. It's in essence, you know, trying to eliminate people's errors. In an essence, it's trying to, you know, look at how human beings make mistakes. And if we look at the history of accidents, you know, I, I don't know the, the, the percentage, but the, most of the accidents happen because of people making mistakes, not following procedure writing the wrong procedure, writing the wrong specification, you know. As we said, us making these mistakes. Yeah. It's clear, Paolo, if you don't do anything, you never make a mistake. Well, Correct. you cannot achieve functional safety if you don't do anything, so we have to do things, and then, of course, we're going to make mistakes. And um, As long as we learn from it, that's it. that's it. Right. So here we have the content. I mean, the content is, of course, important, but also, always, you need to prove evidence that you follow the content. It doesn't make sense to create a monster FSM on a project that no one can follow because then people will start to make their own assumptions and their own interpretation of what is maybe too difficult to achieve. So on one hand, we have to try to keep it simple. On the other hand, we have to try to make it restrictive that people have to follow it and have to prove it. And of course, I would hope that if you go to a company, well, that one company, of course, have a food safety manager who is competent and is actually accountable to prove or responsible accountable to prove that they follow the FSM. It's not just a formality, it is more than that. Thank you, Paolo, for the, can you go okay, to the next slide? sure, next. So, can FSM plan be a part of the quality system as a standard method or should it be issued for every project? All right. That was an interesting a, question. It was mentioned before. It was the question I was referring to. Clearly, yeah. you don't want to reinvent the wheels. That means if you have a QMS or a quality management system, which is actually a good plan, and you can prove you follow it. That's the second question, of course, because mm -hmm. many people have a plan, but they don't really follow it. But now, assume you have a good plan, quality management. Assume you can prove you follow it. Well, the FSM will be pretty straightforward and a lot more easier than if you would not have a QMS, which is clearly described or clearly being followed, that means the FSM goes hand in hand with the QMS. There's no doubt. Do I like to keep them separate? In certain cases, yes, because in certain cases, it depends on the size of the company. If you go to a system integrator, let's say with 20 employees, well then most likely it will be one document. If you go to an EPC contractor with 10,000 employees worldwide and they have you know, a corporate quality management system, it may not fit the office that is doing the project. So what I'm saying here is that clearly we will actually focus more on the FSM applicable for whatever project we are going to. That's here the second one bullet that I'm saying. I like to keep it separate sometimes, depending on the size of the companies. Yeah. But furthermore, here the last bullet, I think on these bigger companies, clearly you need to have an overall FSM for your overall corporate quality approach to safety. But you may have dedicated 
a FSM on a project or a system per system base. And now I'm thinking about a large end user operating company that I worked for years ago on an FSM. They had an overall FSM for their corporate uh, company. Mm -hmm. But in the site that I was actually physically there was not the corporate country that where the headquarters was. That means they were depending from the corporate to follow some instructions. And there we customize an FSM dedicated for the SIS that we were there to help the operating company slash end user with. So what I'm trying to say is very clearly, often we will see a overall FSM and a dedicated FSM per project based or per SIS based. That's a common practice. Thank you, Paolo. Okay. We have a lot of like questions. We'll get to them as soon as we are done with these questions. Okay. Is there a template to prepare a financial safety management plan in accordance with IC 61508? Is there a template, Tino? You know? Of course not. Okay. Of course not. And I'm pretty sure anyone that asked this question, he probably Googled it, he or she Googled it already, and they probably found some templates. I'm not saying the templates you will find on the internet are not good to use. As I said, it has to be customized to your, let's say, project size, company size, competency size, etc. So if you would start from a template, could be maybe good, could be also maybe wrong. So what I'm trying to say is here, there is no template available in the standards for the simple reason it's impossible to make a template that will suit projects worldwide. So they give you guidance. That is why we call a standard a performance-based standard. When you read it, you don't do anything, you will not achieve anything. In other words, you will read the standard, they give you guidance, you will have to perform. That's also, unfortunately, for whoever asked this question, there is no template available. Thank you, Paolo. All right. How do control system engineering and functional safety management interplay? Okay. okay. Let's see if we can uh, get to this question. Well, let's first see that I understand the question correctly because... Yeah, I exactly, because I cannot... I can also maybe misunderstand this question, but I thought the question is more related to a control system. What is a control system for me as an old-fashioned engineer? Control system is a DCS slash BPCS. Yes. So if that was the, the, is the essence of the question, a control system for me is not safety related. That is why what I'm saying here in the first bullet, a control system starts, uh, sorry, stops anything to maximum risk reduction factor 10, which is for us in the safety world, that is still nothing. Anything which is above risk reduction factor 10, so 10.1, that is what we call a SIL-1 performance-based safety related system, which we're going to use here for the SIS. A control system which is not 6511 compatible, therefore, cannot apply the FSM. In other words, an FSM, in our uh, terminology here, is only applicable for an SIS that starts from the range from anything more than risk reduction factor 10 to the maximum end range of a SIL-4 by theory. Of course, everyone knows SIL-4 is not recommended to be used. They ask you to build other risk reduction uh, layers that you will not need that high SIL risk reduction number. Mm -hmm. However, what I'm trying to say is here, I'm pretty sure even for all these years that there is maybe no dedicated standard on quality for control systems, BPCS, DCS, you also have to build a functional system. You have the same problems in control as we have in safety. The only difference is in safety, they are more depending on us than on your control layer because control layers is allowed to fail from us. But if the control layer is failing, our sys layer is the one that needs to be depending, will work when we need it. And of course, it can also fail. That is why we don't have, for instance, a SIL 999 number. We only have a maximum SIL 1, 2, 3, whatever is your risk reduction factor. So we all know say that. It's not possible. Exactly. So even systems with a high SIL number, even they will fail. That is why we have the likelihood to a certain performance band. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Okay, this is next one. What are the standards stating for every supplier of product or service active in the safety life cycle? What are the standards stating for every supplier? Okay, here are the standards. Okay, well, here I, uh, 
actually prepared the answer first totally different. I actually prepared a list of all the standards which I would remember myself from my time that I was doing lots of design and engineering and, or from the projects we have been looking at. But then I thought, actually, this is quite a tricky slide to put up. So I said, let's skip all the numbers of the standards again and, and let's focus on the FSM for a product or a service means that since 2016, as you already have heard here, edition two is out, the FSM is applicable, but you have to prove evidence that the FSM has been used on your activities in the six fifty eleven, And since this is a normative requirement for the six fifty eleven, it is described here in this chapter five of the six fifty eleven. Actually, can you go back, Paolo, one, one slide, because I'm actually, what standards? Ah, okay. Apologies, can you go back to the answer, sure. Paolo? Because my story is fitting probably another question which I maybe was just reading. So, is it applicable for a supplier of product and service? I think we have handled it in the webinar, but very briefly, yes, it is to be used also for anyone producing a service in the life cycle or delivering you a product. The product is linked to the 61508, but the supplier itself is here a supplier of a product can also be, for instance, you buy some products related to the 61508 and you actually provide a complete product like this previous question on online, a HIPS can be considered as a product into the... Well, we have a question here that might uh, clarify, you can clarify. It says, I'm an Atex cabinet manufacturer, which internally all this is. Do I need an FSM? Right. Can we continue to the next slide, Paolo? Can I see the, I think it's the last question, no? if I remember well. Yeah. The last? Well, no, the, the, yeah, we have, uh, this is a, we had a lot of, every time you guys register, ask about questions that are not related to the subject. So they say, do you have section on safety relays? Do you have section on, uh, on uh, safety requirements specification and so on and so on. We have many, many webinars that we run. So you keep checking our schedule live. It's, you know, we are dated all the time. All the sections that have, you can see at the bottom that have already been run, you can see the recording in the YouTube channel. So these are the questions we have received during the registration phase. Now we have some live questions and let's see if you can answer some of this. Yeah, just uh, picking up, I'm picking the ones up which are related to the, to the webinar here, to the film. Yeah, yeah, it, well, some are not, specifically related we have some time before we run out yeah, so got, maybe I got one on, okay i got the one on the grandfathering clause i got a question yeah. here is the grandfathering clause applicable to isa 84 or iec and the answer is uh yes since the following reason when the iec 6511 edition one came out 2004 we did not have anything as a grandfather clause described the grandfather clause definition was actually created or uh, initiated from the ISA 8401 committee, or from the, I, the ISA 84 committee, and they actually came up with this, ter this terminology called the grandfather clause. So what we used to say is edition one of the 61511, although we don't have the grandfather clause terminology in the standard, it's still applicable that when it came out 2004, we had already safety systems built before that. So we had the same concept. Now, this came to an end that we had these different concepts between the ISA 84 and the IEC all the way up to 2016, because with the introduction of the edition two of the 61511, we have a definition in there, which is also uh, now clearly uh, describing the concept of a grandfather clause. That means an existing system, investigate, prove evidence, how you have maintained, how you operate, what much safety have you achieved? So this is the same concept we have now in the edition two. And with the 2018 ISA, no longer 84, it's now called 61511, mm -hmm. it's a lot more clear that worldwide, if you now claim ISA 61511 or IEC 61511, it's the same concept of the grandfather clause. Right, what else? another question that was uh, Peter asked, how does an ASOP relate to FSM? Well, that's a very simple question. If you have seen the life cycle, your HAZOP could probably fit into phase number one, process has the risk analysis. That means the HAZOP team will also have to follow a certain quality of functional safety management. 
regardless of uh, what type of hazard on what specific method you are using. Many people those days are using some software-based HAZOP uh, platforms. That means that uh, you will have to follow the same um, competencies. As an example, I'm thinking about the, com the competencies. i give an example. Assume that you have a company, you hire a consultant, they do a PHA for you, they do the phase one, they're using a platform. Well, the quality is applicable, of course, also on the activity, which is then the HAZOP in that phase number one. And then I would like to see the person that is actually handling, can be the HAZOP leader, can be the HAZOP team. I would like to see what are the competencies of those people that actually are creating that final report called your HAZOP report. Because it would be surprising to see how many people inherit the job they hired by a company X. They told you take over the job from the guy who is leaving. He was using tool X, use tool X. You get a five minutes briefing how to use it and all of a sudden you become the specialist using that tool mm -hmm. how do you think an inspector find evidence that you're competent to use that you can say hey listen you know i'm actually using this tool for the last 10 years i know it inside out that's quite possible but still we would like to see an evidence on how you will convince us and that's a simple question so fsm is for everyone yeah right paulo anything else Will interesting? somebody uh, ask about the uh, uh much, much safety safety security like ic 62443 do we have any any issue between fascia safety management and uh, cyber security well um as you see the question is related to the ic 62443 they have the same life cycle that they copied from the 61511 change the word safety with security that was the starting point that is at least how i see the life cycle of the 62443 and if you look at the life cycle of the 62443 clearly they have the same concept of management of those activities also so to answer very simple i would see it as almost a one-to-one -one principle the functional safety management that we do on the 61511 is also future based applicable for the 62443 and why do i say future based because this is all relatively new the 62443 even the standard keeps on evolving itself the standard 62443 is not very mature yet as some people of you know listening in it came from the isa 99 that means it was the original standard from the isa then they transferred it into the isa 62443 but they keep on bringing out new parts, revised parts, etc. So bottom line is FSM will not be called FSM. It will be most likely called security uh, quality management because it's a security standard, not a functional safety standard. But even there, you will have to follow the same principles. Well, there is a question that might be applicable to our discussion today. It was about systematic failure, random failure. Systematic failure, we can say they are related to FSM, you know, if you don't have a proper FSM, you will end up having failures. What, the, what are the contribution of the two? It's difficult to say, right? Well, the, the question as Paolo is reading, what is the contribution of systematic failures and random failures in general for any given system? Would it be, for instance, 30, 70%? Would it be 50, 50%? Well, mm -hmm. if the 70% was applicable in this question to random failures, I would say, I guess you will have to find better quality better component in your in your uh, in your application or a better let's say quality vendor because if you would have 70% random failures in the whole contribution of failing in in your existing system I think you don't have a very good quality system in place as Paulo was saying you should find a a vendor uh, like here GMI with their safety yes. relays that if you have a, maybe an interposing relay which is not safety related causing 70% of your failures, well, then I think you have made the wrong selection. It's very unfair for me to give you a number, how much would I rate? Clearly, random hardware failures, and I want to finish this uh, answer with that, random hardware failures, that is of the interest of the vendors to build internal mechanism to make the random hardware failures actually by increasing the quality of design to decrease the quality, sorry, the quantity of random hardware failures. But none of us 
have the systematic failures in control unless we do our best to try to avoid them. Okay? Thank okay, you. well, there is a long question. You want to answer this? We are about an hour just now. Fine, I'm fine with that. Uh, I see hello, it says, hello, I'm part of a design engineering company who deals with manufacturers and integrator of SIS for our end user to the design and supply of the SIS. I have a question. Can you guide me with the requirement of safety validation plan for SIS? Well, this will require its own webinar, right? I think uh, maybe we can make a webinar on safety validation plans and clearly, Anything you pick on the life cycle, whatever you are asking the question, it's clearly related to fung safety management. Because when I'm thinking about uh, the safety uh, safety plan, as you're mentioning here, is the safety validation plan. What's a safety validation plan? As the word is saying, you try to validate that the safety of a system will achieve whatever the requirements was. What are the requirements? That was the previous webinar of two days ago. That's your safety requirement specification. Yeah. What is your safety plan? It's finding evidence that actually whatever has been built can be validated to achieve the requirements. And clearly that safety validation plan will also need to follow the functional safety management requirements. And again, what is that? That's the quality on how you will prove that your safety validation plan has been carried out, has been defined in a certain uh, fashion. So that goes all hand in hand. You cannot see, you cannot isolate the safety validation plan from the entire story. Safety validation plan is somewhere in the life cycle and evidence is like a time on your, on your time schedule, on your planning. Where do you prove your system will achieve the safety it has been designed for? All right, Tino. Well, well there was another question that's not really relating to our uh, webinar, but maybe we can give a quick answer. He said, is the seal is assigned to a sieve or to a component? It is assigned to the sieve. You know, each component has a seal rating, but at the end, the seal is that of the sieve. Well, we discussed this in another webinar. Okay, uh, if you want to give one minute answer, then we can go to complete our webinar and we launch our final poll. Okay. You understood the question? Yeah, actually, I thought you were already jumping, but okay, let me answer the question. <laughs> sorry, so sorry, Paul. Well, I mean, I did answer the question. So the SIL is assigned to a SIF, a safety instrumented function. That means any device or interface you're going to use to achieve your safety function needs to, of course, to be suitable to achieve that SIL number you are requiring to. And the question was even going further that, that Paolo has just answered now. So the question is gone for me, but it was also saying, is it only applicable for the safety okay. or for the safety PLC? Well, clearly, as I just said, it's for anything you're using. So that means from your sensor, through maybe your isolator barrier, through maybe your safety PLC configuration, through maybe your final, sorry, your um, interposing relay, through maybe your solenoid, through maybe your final element. So everything in that safety loop, everything is applicable to be under the, let's say, um, architectural constraints to achieve that specific safety level. So it is for everything in there. Of course, it will be hard if you talk about a sill on a mechanical component, if you would say the body of the valve itself, how does that contribute? Again, on this, that's not really related to an FSM, but I can tell you now, that is the challenge, that is the most difficult item in your complete loop. It's typically your final element, which is your uh, mechanical device. Safety valve. Correct. Yeah. Well, every, every item you introduce in your seat will contribute to your failure. So you have to look at it. And right. sometimes, you know, we see the customer, they spend a lot of money selecting uh, seal 3 ESD, sometimes, you know, triplicated or quadruplicated, and then they buy some device, maybe a timer or a relay, they put in the sieve some very, well, maybe high quality, but unknown failure data on the relay and then the whole seal of that loop is gone. All right, I think we are, uh, let me launch this final poll for you guys. How did we do today? What do you think about Tino, our speaker today, and you know, myself, I'm just trying to tag along. 
because we've been we're over our time and uh, all right we have question coming in answer coming in very good do we have any more question i think it's not and uh, for me it's time to start a new day of work and i imagine for you too tino yes guys we thank you for being with us let's end the poll Okay, so most of you think we did excellent. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Keep looking for our other webinars or the recorded one. We'll see you soon. Ciao, Tino. Enjoy you wherever you are. Ciao, Paolo. Thank Down. you. Let me stop this. And next week. You are in control, so you are the only one that can shut it down. <laughs> okay, all right. So I will shut it down. So thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Keep it safe. Thank you. Be safe.